Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Gary. And I'm Sabrina. And today, in our 290th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new raptor bird hybrid, which is pretty awesome, a huge Edmontosaurus bone bed, and a lot more. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Khan. And as always, we like to kick off the episode by thanking a bunch of our patrons as well. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, Gabe, TRX Dinosaurs, Michael, and Vikram and Karthik. And Vikram and Karthik just joined. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your support and for joining us on our watch parties and all the conversations in Discord. We love it. And helping us reach 160 patrons. It's yes. Awesome. And if you want to join this growing community, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, we're starting off with our bird raptor hybrid, which was pointed out to us from Kadoka on Discord and a lot of other people because it's a really cool news story. It was written by Matias Mota and others and published in The Science of Nature. The new dinosaur is from Argentina. It's from the Huincul formation, which is the same as Huinculsaurus that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's got a slightly easier to say name, I would say. It's Oviraptor. It sounds a lot like Oviraptor but it's Overo Raptor. Overo is Spanish for piebald, and you might know what piebald is if you're into horses or dog breeding or something, maybe snakes. A lot of animals can be piebald. Piebald animals are those that have areas with no pigmentation. They tend to have like dark brown or black spots on a white body because the white part is the piebald part, mm. I suppose. You can think of a black and white cow if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Basically is sort of what a piebald animal looks like. And then obviously the second half of the name is raptor for having dromaeosaur-like toe claws. So did they know the color of this dinosaur? No. It's named after the color of the fossil. The like oh. fossils are sort of piebald, splotchy. So they came up with that. Then the species name is Kimentoi, which is after paleontologist Roberto Kimento. The fossils were found in two digs. In 2013 and 2018, it was decades after Huinkelsaurus was found, but I guess they just didn't sit around as long. <laughs> Maybe it was that exciting piebald cover mm. color that got people working on them. Could be. The holotype includes a lot of the right arm, four tail vertebrae, some hip fragments, and parts of the foot, including that all-important sickle claw. But they also found a slightly smaller individual that they're referring to as a paratype, it's about 20% smaller, and they found some more of the hand and foot bones, as well as better hips. So it's pretty. it has a lot of overlapping bones, so they could tell that it was probably the same species. And in addition, they were found together in the same 1.5 meter or 5 foot diameter quarry. So they're very close together, making it even more likely that they were the same species. Although... There were also a couple of other species in that tiny quarry, including a crocodilian and some turtle bones. So made it a little bit confusing, and they briefly thought some of those bones might be dinosaur bones too. But when all is said and done, they reconstructed Oviraptor and came up with about a 1.3 meter or 4 foot long dinosaur. Makes it a little bit smaller than Velociraptor, or maybe about the same size as Velociraptor, depending on which size estimates you prefer. They're not sure if it was an adult or a juvenile. I couldn't find either of those words or anything about histology or lags anywhere in the paper. Or anything about fused bones. There's one mention about unfused metatarsals, but that's only in regards to how it relates to other birds or not. <laughs> Got it. And obviously, that really impacts the overall size of this dinosaur because if one of them is 20% smaller and they're both a year old, you know, who knows how big they'd be at full grown. <laughs> so it would be nice if eventually we figured out the exact age of these. If someone wants to slice into a bone, count the lags and see how old it is. Even though it's named Oviraptor, it is not a dromaeosaur. So it's another one of these poorly named <laughs> raptor dinosaurs. I really don't like it when dinosaurs outside of Dromaeosaur Day are named raptor because it makes it very confusing. But like the researchers, I had originally assumed that it was in Unenlagianae, which is that South American branch of Dromaeosauridae, 
But after their analysis, it came out in a group with just two members, which were Oviraptor and Rahonavis. And Rahonavis is another late Cretaceous bird-ish dinosaur, but it's from thousands of miles away in Madagascar versus this one's in Argentina. And there's a bunch of other raptors that are way closer. (laughs) So it's really weird that those two are the only ones that are in this little group. And in their abstract, they call Rahonavis quote unquote problematic. (laughs) (laughs) I presume because it's so weird and it's in an area not near any of these other bird-like dinosaurs. But now we've just got another one that's I would also refer to Oviraptor as problematic. (laughs) This tiny two-member group of Oviraptor and Rahonavis is right in between Unenlagiidae and Aviale. The group Aviale, if you're not familiar, is typically the dinosaurs that are more like modern birds than like dromaeosaurs. So there should be a distinct dividing line there because you could pick which ones are more like dromaeosaurs and which ones are more like Aviale. But these two dinosaurs being problematic (laughs) are really hard to fit into either. And it's because basically the top half of the dinosaur is a lot like an avialin and the bottom half is a lot like a raptor. Hmm. (laughs) So it's very strange. Essentially what their analysis showed was that elements of Oviraptor's hand are very similar to flying dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx and Confucius Ornus. They even have some derived characteristics that are missing from dinosaurs like Microraptorans, which are considered to be probably pretty good flyers. But on the lower half of the animal, the hips and feet look a lot more like Velociraptor and Unenlagia. Hmm. So again, it's like those weird fast running legs on the bottom and then (laughs) wings on the top that could probably fly or at least nearly fly. We don't actually have any of the leg legs we only have the foot but if you think about a bird leg what we consider its leg actually includes a fair amount of its foot because the foot sticks way up on the leg and it gives it that backwards knee looking thing so we have a lot of the limb but we don't actually have any of the leg leg (laughs) just the foot part of the limb so as a result this is definitely a need more fossils because we really need the leg of this thing and it would also be nice to have the skull and some other parts it's always nice to have the skull yeah Hopefully, they find more of this dinosaur. They've already found two, and the area that it's found from, the Huinkel Formation, is pretty fossilific, if that's a word, (laughs) full of fossils. Fossilific? Yeah, I like that. Up next is a study for which we have plenty of bones. It's an update from the gharial noses that Dave Hone mentioned in an interview a while back on the podcast. It was published by him and a bunch of other authors in Pure J, and in it, they ended up sampling 106 gharial skulls. And if you're not familiar with a gharial, you can think of basically like a spinosaurus. It's more or less what it looks like. It's got a very narrow, long snout compared to other crocodilians. And then at the end of its snout, it's got this big old bump on the top of it when they're males. They have this big, like, It looks almost like a ball that's glued to the tip of the snout on top. And, you know, it's very attractive to the female gharials. So it's important to have the largest nose bump that you can. (laughs) The idea of the study was to look at the male skeletons and the female skeletons and see if there was a difference that you could tell for that nose bump, which is called a gara. Hmm. So if the gara left noticeable things on the skeleton, even though the gara is soft tissue, the idea is maybe there would be obvious things going on with the skeleton and then presumably it would be useful for things like dinosaurs because we could look at dinosaur skeletons and look for similar sorts of features that the gara skeleton might have and then maybe be able to tell male versus female exactly because that's something people have wanted to do for a long time when they first looked at it they immediately noticed that on the skeleton you can see a huge indentation where the gara sits so it kind of carves out a little bit of the skull for the bottom of that spherical gara and obviously it needs a lot of attachment points and blood supply and all that kind of stuff so it makes sense that it would affect the shape of the skeleton but outside of that huge gara ball thing there wasn't really anything else that they could tell distinguished a male from a female including even the width of the skull which is wider in general in males than females but there's enough size variability between the males and females that you couldn't predict which one was a male and a female with 
very good certainty by looking at the width of the skull. I'd say the whole study overall could basically be summarized by saying that there was so much individual variation between the males and the females that there was overlap in most of the features. And this included things like body size, even though on average the males were larger than the females, there were just enough small males and large females that by looking at the skeleton, it didn't let you know which sex they are. So unfortunately, it shows that there's a big difference between the predictive power of looking at a skeleton and knowing which sex it might be versus the sort of association of attributes where like you might say on average males are bigger than females or females are bigger than males but if you're looking at any individual it doesn't really help so probably running into the same problem a lot with dinosaurs there seems to be a lot of individual variation from what we can see so it's going to be really hard to split apart males from females in dinosaurs because even with 106 specimens they couldn't really get a good grasp on it Right. And we never have that many dinosaurs, except for maybe something like Coelophysis, a couple of hadrosaurs. Yeah, but there's progress all the time. So who knows? Yeah. And it, it does mean that maybe for display structures, we might be able to see some things, but it's not going to be all over the skeleton, probably. And then there's always the risk that you just think the ones that have definitively different features because they have that display structure that they might just be a different species. <laughs> It's really hard to know. We do have one more paper that does have a huge sample size. Is that because it's a bone bed? Yes. It was published in PLOS One by Keith Snyder and others, and it is a bone bed. It's actually eight bone beds. Oh, wow. (laughs) In a way, (laughs) of 13,000 Edmontosaurus parts. And I say parts because it's 76% bones. I think it was like over 8,000 bones, but it's also 7% teeth, including theropod teeth, and 17% tendons. Hmm. And they said, quote, almost all the specimens exhibit exquisite preservation, end quote, which might explain why there are so many ossified tendons in the mix. But unfortunately, they're all disarticulated, except for just a couple of vertebrae that seem to be stuck together. Oh, that's so hard to put back together. Oh my God. It's like the craziest jigsaw puzzle you could possibly imagine. Like I mentioned, it's split between eight separate quarries. They total over 500 square meters or over 5,000 square feet in area combined. And they were excavated between 1996 and 2016. So 20 years of excavation on this. And they're all from what they call the Hanson Ranch Bone Bed in eastern Wyoming, which is part of the Lance Formation, and that's a sibling to the Hell Creek Formation, which is the very end of the Cretaceous. So things like T-Rex and Edmontosaurus and all those kinds of dinosaurs were probably in the area too. One of the cool things about all this research is they digitized apparently all of the fossils. Oh, wow. I think all 13,000 of them are publicly available. That's great. <laughs> it's crazy. It might have been easier them. to piece them together, too, in a digital form. That's true. Maybe they did it for other purposes and then just made it publicly available at the end. Because it was completely disarticulated and just a crazy mess, the best thing to do with this kind of data is to look for trends and what kind of bones are around and details like that. They found that the most common bones include the lower part of the hips, the limbs, and ribs, And the least common bones were vertebrae and the upper part of the hips, which is basically the part that connects to the vertebrae. They're sorted vertically in the formation with the largest bones on the bottom and the smallest bones on the top with ossified tendons and teeth just scattered everywhere in the formation. Combining those pieces of evidence, they think it's consistent with, quote, a large number of individuals dying in a single catastrophic event followed by decomposition over weeks to months, end quote. So we've seen this sort of explanation before. It seems like a pretty common occurrence with bone beds. You think of like a catastrophic flood burying a whole bunch of animals in one swoop or something to that effect, because otherwise, why would there be so many animals together in one big lump, especially in cases like this where they're all the same species? They think that If it was a catastrophic event, it must have hit some kind of sweet spot where it was forceful enough to sort the bones, but not forceful enough to damage them very much, because like I said, they're all still in really good condition. The authors propose that the missing vertebrae and upper hips may have still been articulated and therefore didn't get washed all the way to the fossilization site, so they kind of got stuck 
where they were because it was like a bigger stuck together clump <laughs> and the water wasn't forceful enough to move it. But they also said an alternative is that some of the bones still had flesh on them and then floated farther than others. So that caused some sort of separation in what fossilized and what didn't because flesh is more buoyant than just bone. There's a range of sizes, including both sub-adults and adults. It's not a really wide range. It's basically like medium-sized to large-sized Edmontosaurus. And unfortunately, they couldn't determine an exact age using lags. They couldn't find lags in any of the bones that they looked at. The smallest and therefore probably youngest were about three and a half meters or 11 feet long. And that put them at about 50% the size of the largest ones that were in the formation. They propose it might have been a multi-generational herd, hypothesizing that it's a, quote, herd just prior to seasonal breeding, hmm. end quote. So maybe they were all on their way to breed, and then something terrible happened, and now they're in our museum. <laughs> Either way, it's interesting that there aren't any Edmontosaurus smaller than 11 feet long. They think that it could be that these are huge one-year-olds that just grew really rapidly and they got up to 11 feet long by their first birthday. Or maybe the one-year-olds were in a different group and had these little like juvenile groups, which is basically what they show in Walking with Dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. If you remember, they had some of the herbivores. I think it was the Diplodocids. Yeah. They were hiding out in the forest. And then when they got to a certain size, they had to leave because they, were, they didn't fit anymore. So maybe that kind of thing was happening with these Amontosaurus. I was happy to see that they looked for tooth marks, just like we were talking about with the Allosaurus cannibalism. But in this case, there were very few tooth marks on the bones, despite that there were a ton of theropod teeth all over the place. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of weird. What they think is that it might mean that there was just so much meat from all these animals having died that... They couldn't eat it all. Yeah, and they didn't have to like get way into it and start scraping flesh off bones. Oh, yeah, they just eat the parts they want. Yep, the easy to reach big chunks of meat and then move on to the next one because why bother <laughs> wasting time scraping off every last bit? It's a feast. Exactly. Either a feast or a very sad situation, depending on which way you're looking at it from. But it's good for us. Lots of good scientific data. In other dinosaur news, there's a petition in Massachusetts to replace a Christopher Columbus statue with the Saugus Route 1 orange dinosaur. There's nearly 5,000 signatures. Is that to get it out of harm's way? Is that the one that keeps getting hit by trucks? This is the one we've talked about before where it was moved because it was on the Route 1 mini golf and batting cages property and that was being turned into apartments, hotel shops, and a parking uh, garage. Gotcha. Yeah. But it's a landmark in itself. So one petitioner wrote, quote, in the world of Rugrats, the children idolize Reptar and this orange dinosaur could be the Reptar for our United States, a powerful stalwart mentor and protector of this fine nation. <laughs> That's a really weird analogy. <laughs> I think they're being a little facetious there. <laughs> but yeah, we do keep bringing up this orange dinosaur a lot because I was looking in past notes and a few years ago, a brewery launched a beer in honor of the Saugus dinosaur. They had an orange beer with mango and passion fruit aromas. And then, yeah, we've talked about its move. So we'll see what happens. Next, thanks to Miriam who shared this one with us. So in Gwinnett County in Georgia, as part of the Meet Me in the Park program, there's going to be eight prehistoric animal statues placed in the parks with clues to their locations on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, some of these statues are dinosaurs. You got City Potty, Displetosaurus, Myasaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, Dilophosaurus, and Stegosaurus. And if you live in the area, the statues might look familiar because they used to be at a Duluth area shopping center. And I just want to point out, and it's in all of the messaging around this, make sure to follow CDC guidelines and practice social distancing while you're looking for the dinosaurs. Also, these dinosaurs will probably be on the move again next year. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And then last, there's a really fun stop motion video featuring the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. It's kind of like the Lost World, the 1925 silent movie version. And so it features Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. And then you see cameos of other sculptures from Crystal Palace dinosaurs, like the Irish elk. Nice. Yeah, really well done. And it's short. It's only a few minutes. I like those Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Me too. They were like the dinosaur podcast of the 1800s. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that they were outreach, right, to teach people about dinosaurs. True, true. And deep time. Mm-hmm. 
And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Khan, which was a request from Michael via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. It was an oviraptorid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia. And it looked a lot like other oviraptorids. It did not, however, have a crest on its head like oviraptor. Khan had a beak and no teeth and a short tail and a small body. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> Three specimens have been found, and two individuals were about four feet or 1.2 meters long, and the third individual found was larger. One study found that that was six and a half feet or two meters long. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good size. So it may have been an omnivore. It probably had feathers. It definitely had big feet. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to sound kind of weird. <laughs> you could say that about pretty much any dinosaur. So articulated feet in all three specimens were well preserved, and the whole foot is about 32% of the length of the hind limb. The type species is Khan McKennaei. It was first found with its tail sticking out of a small hill, and then the second specimen was found near it, and both of them had broken necks, so they were killed by the same event. Wow, weird. Yeah. At first, it was thought to be in Genia in 1995 and 1996, but a 2001 study found enough differences in the hands to make it its own genus, so it was named in 2001 by James Clark and others. And the genus name comes from the Mongolian word Khan, which means lord or ruler. And the species name is in honor of paleontologist Malcolm Carnegie McKenna. It's closely related to Concoraptor, and the holotype is a nearly complete skeleton. So the first specimen was found in 1993, and then the other two specimens were found in 1995, and those two specimens found together have been called Romeo and Juliet and Sid and Nancy. Those are the ones that both have a broken neck? Yes. Oof. So the nickname Sid and Nancy is after the Sex Pistols bassist and his girlfriend, and the dinosaurs Sid and Nancy were, slash Romeo and Juliet, were buried alive when sand dunes collapsed on them and then were preserved from the sand dunes and heavy rains, and since they died together, they probably interacted with each other while they were alive. It's kind of a tragic death, which is how they got these nicknames. Because Romeo and Juliet and Sid and Nancy are also tragic pairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So based on the Sid and Nancy specimens, Khan may have been a social animal. There's also remains of juveniles that have been found together in a bone bed, and so they died together, and maybe they lived in a flock. A <laughs> flock. Yeah. <laughs> Flocks of dinosaurs are always entertaining. There's a chance that we can see sexual dimorphism in Sid and Nancy. So these specimens were about the same size, same build, probably around the same age, but one of them had large bony structures in the tail, which may have been to support muscles used for tail feather displays like modern peacocks. Interesting. Yeah, Scott Persons and others ruled out pathology, so it's not an injury or disease or an infection or anything, and said that the structures were too different to be individual variation. And they also found that both of these specimens were adults based on fused vertebrae. Wow, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So the, the thinking is that the one with the muscles for the tail feather displays was probably male, and the one with the smaller bony structures was probably female, and that would allow there to be more room and make it easier to lay eggs. The team did note that this instance of sexual dimorphism was linked only to Khan McKenna eye, and there weren't enough specimens of other oviraptorosaurs to know for sure. Yeah, now we gotta look at all of them. Look at all the tails, see what we see. Mm -hmm. And look at that bone bed of the juveniles, because a lot of times the juveniles don't have those structures yet. And our fun fact of the day is inspired by a new article by Daniel Sepka and others and published in Current Biology. And I'm just going to quote him directly from his presentation at SVP 2018 when he said, quote, birds are the only group of animals that rival mammals in terms of brain size, end quote. That's why I think they're always scheming. Yes, it's definitely birds and mammals in competition for the apex of all <laughs> ecosystems, <laughs> it seems like. And the new paper expands on his research and on the talk that we covered all those years ago when he did this presentation. It basically shows that the avian dinosaurs, also known as birds, that survived the end Cretaceous extinction had similar sized brains to some of the smarter dinosaurs, including T. rex and troodontids. Shortly later, their brains started growing rapidly relative to their body size. All of this stuff is relative to body size, because otherwise you're really comparing apples and oranges. Corvids, the group that includes crows and magpies, although not Australian magpies, apparently those are not corvids. What? They're not even really magpies. Oh. Something I learned from birding. <laughs> All I know is they're aggressive. Yes, they're intense. 
I don't know if the ones in other parts of the world are as intense as the ones in Australia. It seems like probably not. Everything in Australia seems overly aggressive. Not everything. Just a lot of the animals, like the flies. But the corvids in general evolved larger brains and bodies at the same time, which is something pretty unique. And that's something that humans also did. So while we were getting bigger physically, our brains were proportionally getting larger as well. So they weren't just matching the scale of our increased size. The brain was increasing in size even more rapidly than our body was. And you see that same thing in corvids. Parrots and crows have the highest brain body size ratio. So parrots also have pretty big brains. But in general, parrots, as they get bigger, their brains don't scale up as much. Weirdly, surprisingly to me, owls were also pretty high on the brain to body size ratio, but apparently a large part of their brain is for processing sight because they're one of the only nocturnal birds. So it's still pretty true that owls are undeserving of their wise reputation. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's mostly because owls seem to have a big head but it's all feathers. Mm. (laughs) If you get rid of the feathers on an owl head, it just looks like a vulture. They also have big eyes. Yes. They look wise. They do. But basically they're, they're like pigeons. Their entire thing is being able to see really well. Hmm. A lot of people think pigeons are cool. I think they're pretty cool after learning more about them too. I've been attacked by a few too many pigeons. (laughs) Yeah, no, you don't get along with dinosaurs in general. (laughs) We stay inside and we talk about dinosaurs that are extinct. (laughs) That's what we do with them. On the other end of the spectrum, moas were by far the least intelligent or had by far the lowest ratio of brain size to body size. It was lower even than every single non-avian dinosaur they included in their test. So somehow that group got way less intelligent. Or maybe what happened was their body scaled way up and the brain didn't bother to keep up much at all. My takeaway from this research, though, is that we're lucky that mammals managed to grow in size and brain capacity before the dinosaurs regained their dominance (laughs) after the Cretaceous. So we had a chance. Yeah, we barely snuck into that window because the corvids were getting really smart millions of years ago, but mammals had already established their place at the top of most food chains by then. So, yeah, good job us and our ancestors. That asteroid really did wonders for mammals. <laughs> it did. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. You can subscribe in any podcast player of your choosing. It's the best way to listen. We're on all of the major platforms, Pocket Cast, Podcast Addict, CastBox, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, everywhere you can find a podcast. It's the best place to listen. Yeah, and you can also join our growing community on Patreon, patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.